I'm a female. I'm turning 19 this year, but this story happened when I was 15. I'm also from France. When I was 15 and just got into my junior year, I created my first Twitter account that I deleted because of this story. I didn't tell anyone my username, neither my family nor my friends, because I didn't have any. My profile picture was an avatar, so no pictures of me on the account, and as far as location, I said Paris because I lived in the suburbs. I didn't have many followers, 20 or maybe 30, and I didn't follow that many people, so my timeline was, wasn't really that interesting. One evening in October, someone sent me a quite strange direct message. It was a 200 followers account, and the message was like, Hi, my name is Rob. I just turned 17 and wanted to know if you lived in stating my hometown because I'll soon move in and go to that town's high school and I'm looking for friends. The town he said was obviously the town I lived in. I immediately thought something was wrong because there was nowhere on my profile I said where I actually live but after some time thinking I remembered of a tweet that I made weeks ago about buses and I mentioned the city so I told myself that he must have looked up for that town and found my tweet. His age wasn't shocking because I'm two years ahead of my classmates. I was bored, and since he was polite, I answered him. I told him that I was indeed from that town and I go to the high school there. The discussion was natural and we talked a lot that night, mainly about high school, about the food at the cafeteria, about the teachers, that kind of thing. But as it was getting very late, he tried to interpose some personal questions like, Do you live far away from the school? In a house or an apartment? Do you live with both your parents? There's five of you? You're not often home alone, right? I never answered because it was way too shady for me and unfortunately he didn't insist. Unfortunately because if he did, I would have probably blocked him. The next day the same thing. We talked a lot and he was still asking personal questions to know me better so I asked him too and he always answered with what seemed like honesty. I still didn't answer the questions about my house though because he didn't need to know anything. It lasted two or three weeks but it was enough for me to develop feelings for him. He was handsome, super kind and it was everything I needed because I had been bullied for years and even today I still develop strong feelings but most importantly blind trust in people who are friendly to me. In France, in October, we have a two-week long vacation, and the day before back-to-school day, he finally told me he was coming to my high school because he had finally moved in with his mom and asked about a place to meet during the morning break. I was so happy and relieved to be able to meet him and told him to join me in the hall. But when he understood that there would be people around, he said that he would prefer an isolated place because he was afraid he would not recognize me and didn't want to spend the break looking for me. It was a good excuse for me, so I told him to meet me in the third floor bathroom because we weren't allowed to stay there during the breaks and no one would disturb us. In my head, even though I was a little bit creepy, I was still in school so nothing could happen to me. Next day, back to school day, I made myself pretty. I wore my best clothes, I counted down the minutes, and finally when break time had arrived, I ran to the bathroom and waited. And when he arrived, it was him. He wasn't a catfish. He looked quite like his profile, but I still noticed that he seemed a little bit older than he had told me. I thought 20 years old instead of 17. We talked a lot, we got along well, and I was so pleased. And at the end of the break, he had asked me to go to the fast food restaurant with him for lunch. I said no because I didn't have any money and I always refuse for people to pay for me. It's kind of my principle. He seemed disappointed, but offered to walk me home after classes. I explained I have to take the bus, but that he could walk me to the bus stop. He looked disappointed, again, but finally accepted. And that's exactly what happened, and it was so great that it quickly became some kind of routine. We met in the third floor bathroom during the morning break, and he walked me to the bus stop after classes. A surprising fact is that I never saw him in the hallways nor at the cafeteria, but I thought that at the time that the building was huge and there was over 1,500 students in here, so if our schedules didn't coincide, there was no way we could meet each other. This little game lasted until December, so almost a month and a half. The 14th of December, a Thursday, I complained about how lonely I was going to be that evening because my dad was abroad for work, my brother was always at his friend's house, 
My little sis was on a school trip and my mom had to work late that very night. It was very reckless of me, but after weeks I thought I could trust him. That evening, he walked me to the bus stop. We both waited. I got in the bus, waved at him and put on my earphones. I had two stops before my house. It was about 5.45pm in December, so it was already really dark outside and as I got out of the bus, I had a really bad feeling. There was that very uncomfortable sensation in my stomach and I felt like I was being watched. I pressed the pause on my music but kept my earphones in so that people thought that I couldn't hear anything and that's probably what saved my life. I lived in a suburban neighborhood, very silent, especially at night, so there was no visibility on the big road that the bus dropped me off on. When I heard footsteps behind me, I understood that I was right. There was someone following me and he was not well-intentioned. At least, I could hear that he was not accelerating, so he was not trying to catch up to me, but I couldn't guess how long it would last. As quietly as possible, I tried to reach for my keys in my pocket, and when I finally pulled them out, I ran, as fast as I could, the best sprint of my life. I don't know how it worked, but I managed to open and to close the door before he could reach me. I then deactivated my alarm, which, by the way, confirmed that I was home alone, and took a look through the glass panel on the door. It's not a peephole, it's a whole window, so if someone wanted to see what's happening inside, they can. And it was Rob. A few meters away, looking at me with a really creepy face. He followed me to my home, probably with a car, and he was clearly not here for a chit-chat. I still don't know why I didn't call the police then. I was completely paralyzed. We both stared at each other for a few minutes and when I took back control over my body I ran into the kitchen to get a knife and got back to the door. He was there too, banging against the door. I feared for a second that the glass would break, but it didn't. That moment when I was pushing against the door praying for it not to break while he was kicking harder and harder was the longest I've ever experienced. After maybe five minutes he stopped and got around the house, knocking against every shutter and got back to the door. He looked angry, but then my neighbor's car reached my house and Rob ran away, probably thinking it was my mom coming home. On Twitter, Rob sent me a thousand messages before I could block him. He then deleted his account and I thought I was done with his story, but quickly after some accounts which had been created followed me. Their ats were all a series of numbers in the first letter of his name, and as soon as I blocked one, another one would follow me. I chose to delete my account because I couldn't make it stop, and it was too hard to endure because they were sending me dozens of insulting DMs. Later I talked to the people who were supposed to be Rob's classmates because I haven't met him again in days, but not a single one even heard about a Rob. This guy was never a student in my high school and that is why I've never met him apart from our daily meetings, and that is probably why he seems so old. I never heard about him anymore, and I'm still asking myself, what did he want, and what could have happened that night? So I'm a woman and I'm currently 24, but was 22 when this happened. Just so you have an idea of the layout, I live in a two-story townhouse, and there is a one-story townhouse right below me. The entrance to their house is on the opposite side of my entrance, but I have a back patio that is located right above their house entrance. It was the summertime and early in the evening around 4 or 5 p.m. I was hanging out with a friend who I'll call Jay in my room on the second story of my house. Suddenly I heard distressing noises from outside. There are lots of kids in my neighborhood, and I'm no stranger to rowdy and loud neighbors, but this made me worried. I ran to my window and opened it to try to hear better and looked around to see where the noise was coming from. I couldn't see anything, but I could hear a woman clearly in distress saying things like, Stop. Now, I'm a domestic violence survivor with PTSD, so this immediately put me on high alert. I expressed my concern to my friend, and he went outside to try to figure out what was going on. While I went downstairs and onto my balcony to try to get a better view, he came back in and told me that in my parking lot, which was to the side of our row of townhouses and out of view, 
he had seen glimpses of a young man and woman arguing. I was still worried and could still hear the distressing noises, so I stayed on the balcony watching for what was going on. A couple of minutes later, the man and woman came into view. They were around my age. She had obviously been crying a lot, and he had his hands on his shoulders, leading her in the direction of the house below me in a way that seemed almost forceful. At this point, I didn't care about being nosy, and I tried to ask the girl if she was okay. She kept her head down and didn't answer. I got angry and asked him what he was doing, but he ignored me too. At this point, Jay had run down to try to intervene. He's had to witness and survive abuse himself, so he wasn't taking this lightly, but the man had slammed the door on him before he could do anything. I was freaking out and trying to figure out what to do, when my friend told me that he could see a lot of movement through the sheer curtains outside and that it looked like a struggle was happening. I could even hear bumps from the house below me. I decided to just give in and call 911. For reference, this is the only time I've ever called the cops on a neighbor to this day. I told them what was happening and they didn't seem to think it was urgent, but said that they would send an officer. I grabbed my taser, I've experienced a lot of harassment and have it to make me feel safe, and went down to wait in front of my neighbor's house for them, trying to think of a way I could help the girl. After a few minutes, an older man with his young daughter walked up to us and asked what was going on. This man spoke mostly Spanish, and my friend Jay did too, so most of the conversation happened through him. The man told us that the house was his, and that the younger man was renting a room from him. He seemed alarmed when we described what the man was doing to his apparent girlfriend. He offered to let us come inside and wait for the police there while the younger man kept himself and his girlfriend locked in his room. We made awkward conversation in the living room for a few seconds when suddenly the girl came walking down the hallway, grabbing her purse and making to leave. I was so relieved to see her and asked if she was okay when, before she could answer, an arm shot out from around the corner and hooked itself around her waist, dragging her back into his room. This was the last straw for me. I ran after them but didn't make it before he locked her in his room. I banged on the door with my taser in the other hand, shouting at him to let her go. I then called the police again and told them to hurry, as I could hear the movement in the room and was worried about what he was doing to her. I continued to bang on the door, half hoping to break it down myself, and cussing and screaming at the guy to open it and let her go. I didn't stop until the cops finally got there, and after he didn't open the door for them either, broke it down. Finally, the girl was free, and I could see that she was, for the most part, okay. I listened as she gave the cops her statement, telling them that he had been holding her down in the room and even choking her while he had her in there. She and the cops thanked me for getting involved, and I briefly told them that I knew what it was like and that I wasn't going to not do anything about it when another person was being put through that. This was the only time during that interaction that I had to hold back tears, though granted as soon as I got home I burst into sobs. Before the girl left I offered her my phone number in case she needed anyone to talk to, but she sweetly told me that it was okay. Sometimes I still wish I had just given it to her just in case she ever changed her mind so I could be there for her. The guy was there for a few more hours getting interrogated and being very uncooperative with the police. I was fine with this because it meant that he would likely get a harsher sentence. But after the girl's mom picked her up, I didn't care to stay anymore. I just needed to know that she was okay and safe. The experience actually turned out to be a pretty healing one for me. I never had enough evidence to report my own abuser and always felt guilty about it, but the fact that I was able to get the cops involved in the situation at the perfect time when the abuse was actively happening so there was no way that the perpetrator could deny it, it made me feel a little bit better about that. Even more importantly, the fact that he got locked up for over a year meant that I helped this girl get free, and that means the world to me. I can still think about her sometimes and wish that I could see how she's doing. I wish I could hug her and tell her how strong she is, but knowing that at least she's not under his control anymore gives me so much peace. I was in my early 20s and I'm 6 foot flat, 
200 pounds and as broad as a brick house, and this comes into play later. Now my family, just like anyone else's, has its share of dysfunctional members. This one just seems to have an overwhelming amount. Sadly, my dad is the only one that left that type of life behind and was able to make something of himself from an abusive, toxic environment that made everyone else that way. It also made him the lightning rod for emotional drama. That is what brought this about. My uncles are or were all addicts at some point in their life. Some turned around and some still ride the white horse. One of the uncles on the White Pony Express decided that doing coke and chasing it down with booze isn't the best course for a 45-year-old with a kid that never sees him. He tried to reach out to my grandmother to get off the wagon, but she couldn't be bothered to talk him down off the edge and shoved him off on my dad. He was looking for a way out, and my dad did what he could to help him find one because that is what family does. They talk for months, off and on, so on and so forth. My dad keeps doing what he can. However, he remains cautious because he knows addicts are not the most upfront people. But months pass and my uncle improves. He goes six months sober, reconnects with the son a little, actually gives sobriety a solid shot, the whole nine yards. November rolls around and it is month seven and my cokehead uncle, or CHU for interest of anonymity, is in town, sober, and wants to thank my dad for his help. He finally shows up around Thanksgiving and he spends the day with the family. He buys dinner, he puts up good conversation, does the song and dance. Sadly, he gives off more red flags instead of putting worries to bed. He goes to the bathroom every 30 minutes, gets caught going into bedrooms, studying each and every room and what's in it, seeing semi-valuable items and tries to look at them while you're distracted. The usual behavior. You may hear this and think, well... Maybe he's appreciating the rooms, or he's showing appreciation for your family's things, or maybe he has a bladder infection and that's why he's in the bathroom leaking like a sieve. All are reasonable assumptions, but for anyone that knows addict behavior, and yes, I've lived with people that have done this, and that's not what's happening. The evening ends without incident, and even though some behavior was highly questionable, nothing is leaving a bad taste in anyone's mouth. CHU says goodbye, but... Not without mentioning he has a job coming up in a few weeks and he wants to stop by and say goodbye before he leaves. Time rolls on and November turns into December and things are as normal as ever. The year is ending, my dad and uncle talk a couple of times and it is now Christmas Eve 2018. My uncle was supposed to be leaving for a job early the next day and he was supposed to come over but never did. It's no surprise no one heard anything from him as it was par for the course my dad and brother are packing for the mountains. It's a snowstorm that night and we were going to head up for some Christmas snowboarding. I leave for work after making plans to meet them on the slopes for the following day. I work, deal with the usual dumb customer questions, clock out 14 hours later, grab dinner, and go home. I get back home as the snow begins. The cul-de-sac is quiet, Christmas lights are blinking, and the wind isn't howling. It's a beautiful night. I get inside, go change out of my work clothes, and can begin my three-day weekend. I make dinner, cop a squat on the couch, and flip on the news. Everything is going smooth. A nagging feeling begins to creep its way into my consciousness, though. I think it's just the excitement for fresh snow and the small crowd turnout for the day and go back to my meal. The feeling keeps growing and growing as the night goes on, and I start feeling that it isn't anticipation for fresh pal. As if on cue, the back door creeps open. Mike Nelson's weather report is muffled by the sound of fresh snow being crushed under winter boots. I watch as my uncle helps himself inside. No knock at the front door, no rung doorbell, not even an awkward moment of shoving his face on the window to look in. Nothing. He walks in, dressed in the latest breaking and entering quarterly, I mean beanie, duffel bag, everything. I failed to mention the back door leads to the dining living room and if you aren't looking you would miss someone sitting on the couch if you aren't looking, which he wasn't. A solid minute passes and he hasn't noticed me. My brain is racing for something to say but all that comes out is, what are you doing? He whips his head around and sees me. Fear, shock and regret explode across his face. If he soiled himself in that moment it would not have shocked me. He 
drops the black duffel bag, defeated. Standing there collecting himself, he looks for the right thing to say. Now I get my dad on the phone because if my uncle was coming over, he would have said something which he didn't. My dad picks up and I say, Hey, he just came in through the back door, is he supposed to be here? CHU finally finds his words. Please hang up the phone, I got nowhere to go, please, please. My dad is livid, screaming about the situation. He then tells me to put him on speakerphone. CHU gets ripped the biggest new one I'd ever heard. My dad is his older half-brother and he gets into how dare you and you should be ashamed and every older brother phrase in the book. The situation keeps getting tense and I tell my uncle, he's gotta go. He grabs his stuff and I am bigger than he is and he starts getting ready to leave. We start moving to the exit trying to keep it non-physical, doing what I can to not make a bad situation worse. My dad is still on the phone, continuing his rant. I get him outside and the rant subsides. My dad apologizes to me and tells me he should have told me he might show up. My brother luckily has called the police so I don't have to both usher and get the police on the phone. My dad makes sure I'm okay and makes sure I get everything locked up. I lock up all the windows, doors, etc., CHU would have had an easier time getting through the Great Wall than getting in again. Cops show up, go through the routine. What happened? Where'd he enter? Is anything stolen or broken? Is it alright if he stays inside to wait for his ride to pick him up? Now my dad wasn't pressing charges and just wanted CHU gone, so he agreed to have the cops just hold him until he can get a ride to leave. Have that be the end of it. But the last question threw me off quite a bit. I wanted to be sarcastic but thankfully chose not to. I told the officer that under no circumstances was I letting CHU back in my house. That seemed to dissatisfy the officer but I didn't care. My uncle breaks in and now that he's out you want me to take him back in and off your hands? That's not going to happen. He left and wished me a good night and eventually CHU got picked up and taken to a hotel. The commotion dies down and I go outside to see what I could find in the snow. Try to give him the benefit of the doubt. In that fresh snow was the worst piece of evidence of all. I found tracks. My uncle's tracks, obviously. They showed everything and it broke my heart. I could see where he got dropped off and loaded up his stuff and see how he just beelined for the back door. It was disappointing and I was just glad he was gone. I finally relax but I can't sleep. I finally nod off at around 1am and wake up later than expected and head out to meet up with everyone. I get up there, meet up with my dad and brother and head to the mountain that we were going to for the day. We finally get to talking about the night before and my dad fills in some of the blanks. I'd come to find out that my uncle had called my dad before and was trying to spend the night before leaving the next day. My dad said no. He said that it was going to be up in the mountains and my uncle would have to find somewhere else to go. My uncle said fine and my dad thought that that would be the end of it. How wrong he was. The truth wouldn't be found out until a little later. What then happened after my dad got off the phone with my uncle is this. He told his boss that he has a place that he's staying at and needs to be dropped off there for the night and he can be picked up here the next day. As he had no car and was leaving town the next day. My uncle's boss, not having any knowledge of how the conversation my uncle and dad had, just went along with it. He'd taken my uncle from the job they were on to my dad's house. My uncle expected no one to be home, which is insane. Who does that and thinks it's a good idea? Oh yeah, addicts. Anyway, he betrayed my family's trust and went right back to what he does best. He was not counting on anyone being there at all and the choice to exploit that cost him a brother. I haven't seen or heard from him in two years and don't really want to. I hope that he's doing okay and trying to stay sober. I don't wish him any ill will and hope he can pull himself together. It breaks my heart seeing my family like this, but you can't fix something that doesn't want to be fixed. I was 14 when this started. For reference, I'm a girl. It started off as me playing a trivia game. There was an option to private message people, so the person I was playing up against messaged me. It was innocent, and I was young and naive. It was the start of a friendship. 
After talking for maybe a week, we exchanged Facebooks and started talking on Messenger. John was his name. John told me he was 18 and that he lived in America. After talking for a couple of weeks, he told me that he started to like me, but I never wanted a relationship. I thought this was just kind of a friendship. I get how dumb I was, but by this time we were talking for months already. We had each other's numbers and everything. Sometimes we FaceTimed and texted a lot until everything started to change. I remember once I slept in and woke up to over 30 messages. It was John. He asked me why I wasn't answering him and asked if I was leaving him. I explained that I had just slept in, but he was already upset. I had to convince him that I wasn't leaving him, in his words. Another day he told me how he was going to leave and how he was going to end his own life. I was scared and I didn't know what to do. My friend and I thought that it would be best if I told him that I loved him. I didn't, but I wasn't about to be responsible for someone's death, I thought. John then told me it was a test. A test? I was young and scared, so I stayed, and it just got worse and worse from then on. Being 14, I had stuff to do, school, youth group, and stuff like that, so I wasn't always on my phone. He would constantly be mad at me for not answering him, and I told him that I was busy. When you're busy, tell me first, he said. I was getting annoyed. No, I said. I told him to relax and that I wasn't leaving, I was just busy. I didn't get why he was so controlling. One day he told me that he cheated on me. I was surprised considering we weren't in a relationship and I made that clear to him. He sent me messages of him telling another girl that he liked her and I told John to go for it and I didn't want him obsessed with me. Like I said, we weren't in a relationship but now looking back it seemed like he thought so despite the number of times I told him we weren't. I told my friend about him and next thing I know we started talking. Again, we were young and innocent and we both saw him as a friend. So one day when me and said friend had a sleepover, I had this great idea to have a FaceTime sleepover. Basically, when we went to sleep, we would stay on FaceTime. I thought it would be cool because I'd never had a FaceTime sleepover before. I now regret it. Weeks went by and John and I got into a fight. He said he was going to delete all of his pictures of me from his phone. Pictures? Yeah, I was just as confused. What pictures of me did he have? He screen recorded all the pictures and videos of me and selected them all, saying he was going to delete them. That's when I saw something terrifying. He recorded every FaceTime we had. All my pictures from Facebook and Instagram and, the most scary thing, a six hour long video of my friend and I sleeping. I was horrified. I told him to delete the pictures. I told him I was done. This creepy friendship was over. Or so I thought. He sent me a picture of a bunch of pills in his hand and told me that he had swallowed them and that it was all my fault. I cried. Obviously looking back I realized that this was a way of getting me to stay but I didn't know that at the time. I was scared that he was really going to hurt himself. I really wanted to leave but I didn't want to feel responsibility for someone's death. I made him promise to never do that. In return, I had to promise to tell him if anything bad were to happen to me. After that, I blocked him on every single thing. It took me a while to get over it, but after that, I felt free. I learned my lesson, and obviously I never messaged him after that. And after that experience, I don't easily make online friends. I now know to be much more careful in that even if they seem really nice, they might turn out to be the opposite. Before we get into the story, let me start by saying I was a 12 year old female at this time and even though I was very mature for my age and knew many things about the world that other 12 year olds didn't, I was lonely, depressed and craving attention and reassurance from someone outside of my family. Because of this, I was naive and didn't want to believe that he was just manipulating me. Now that that is out of the way, let's set the scene. I was playing a team-based first-person shooter game called Overwatch, and I was playing a support character named Mercy. Her job is to keep everyone alive and healed. So this person, who I'll call Jason from now on, was a sharpshooter on my team, and he was doing really well, and so was I. 
After we had won the game we had played together, he invited me to his group that included him and this other girl. Nothing was weird at first, and he was acting normal, but as soon as his friend left, he started saying slightly creepy things to me. They would range from, you're doing so good, hon, to, you're so sweet and pretty, and a couple of other slightly alarming things. This is only after about an hour of us even being in a group together. Let me say right here and now, I never once showed him my face, and I never fully talked to him over the mic, just sort of small hey's or good nights, and the only reason I did that was because he pressured me into it. Let's get into the even more alarming things that he would say and do. So after a couple of hours of just general chatting about random things and him repeatedly calling me things like baby and honey, he would say stuff like, you just make me so happy, I want to stay with you. And as I recall, he even said he loves me even though it had been like four hours of me knowing him and all the while I was super uncomfortable but didn't want to say anything so I just told him basically what he wanted to hear but I never told him that I loved him. We were on Discord at this point and on a call. I was typing while he was talking over the mic. The cringy little things that he would say would continue on for a while and it probably took me a solid hour to get him to go to bed because he kept saying that he just wants to be with me and he doesn't want to be alone and that he wishes I were there with him and a bunch of other weird things to say to a stranger. Now you may be all wondering, well, it's not like he knew you were 12, and you're right, he didn't, but I didn't know his age at the time either, and it's still a bit weird to say to a stranger. Now let's move on to the even more questionable things that he has said that would raise red flags for anyone with common sense, but I was naive and was really blinded by the way he made me feel which is exactly what predators do. They comfort you and they will make you weaken your defenses around them so then you don't realize that what they're doing is extremely inappropriate. So basically at this time I lied and told him I was 14 because, I don't know, I guess I wanted him to continue to talk to me and comfort me and then he revealed that he was 18 and that his name was Jason. I expressed my concerns to him about being 5 years older than me and he pulled the age as just a number line and continued with, I could make you happy and I could help you with your depression. Around this time, I was feeling worse and worse every day mentally. He was draining me so much more than I realized. He made me feel numb and even more worthless even though he kept spouting compliments and praises. I think the reason it was draining me is because he would get really upset when I told him I didn't love him back and basically try and guilt trip me into saying that I love him but I never did because I knew that if I ever told him to buzz off or quit being a creep that he would say that I let him on. Jason tried to convince me to be in a temporary relationship. Sure, it sounded nice on paper. It won't be official, just try to think about if you do love me or not. There are no boundaries and if you decide you don't love me then just end the relationship. After a while of him trying his hardest to get me to agree to try to manipulate me into it, I finally broke and agreed. He immediately asked if he could tell people he had a cute girlfriend. I obviously told him no because A, I was uncomfortable and B, I basically only agreed to get him to shut up. So when he asked why he couldn't, I said it was because we didn't know if it was temporary or not. Some honorable mentions of things this creep had said to me consist of him asking if he could get in the shower with me when I told him I had to go because I had to take a shower. Me almost getting sent a picture of his privates. Alright, let me explain why it was only almost. He had asked if I wanted to see something long and tasty and I misread tasty and nasty and my slightly innocent brain went to a snake or an actual nasty hot dog. I just replied with no thanks and... To say the least, I'm so glad that I said this because I didn't want to see some two-inch shriveled mushroom and thankfully he respected at least that one thing. I mentally facepalm myself any time I think about how badly I misinterpreted that. Another was him saying that he doesn't want me telling the police or my parents that I was talking to him because he didn't want me to say, oh he did this and arrest him. This my friends is a classic line for groomers. They try and tear you away from loved ones so that they are the only bond you have and they try and make it seem like if you did come forward about inappropriate behavior that it would be completely your fault. He also called me sexy multiple times. 
After I had enough of him saying that he loves me and trying to guilt trip me, I decided to tell my older sister who decided to talk to him pretending to be me and this is basically how their conversation went. This was from my perspective. Hey, I'm sorry but I don't want to be with you. Is it because of our ages? Yeah. Also now you made up your mind. No, I just don't know if I love you. Would you kiss me? Sure, but I'm a skeleton. This is my way of saying no without being harsh. Would you hug me? Sure, but I'm quadriplegic. Would you sleep next to me? Sleep? Who's that? You love me romantically, not platonically, by the way. Notice how he chose for me. Yeah, major red flag. He was either oblivious when not picking up on the fact that I was saying no, or he was desperate to get me back so that he could keep manipulating me. After I firmly told him I don't love him romantically, he threatened to end his life, which is also common in manipulators, which grooming is a form of. I tried to calm him down and tell him that I can be there for him, but not in the way that he wanted, and he kept deflecting and started using guilt tactics. Eventually, he told me he thought that he might be gay, and I just basically said, okay, good for you. And I'm almost positive he said that just to make me jealous, but when it didn't work, he reverted back and said that he was wrong about being gay. One thing led to another, and my sister and I told my other sister, who I was living with at the time, and she ended up saying that I was actually 12, and he still kept up the age as just a number thing. Eventually, she posed as me and called him. Her and her boyfriend yelled at him for talking to a 12-year-old in that way, and he blamed it all on me, saying he didn't say any of those things. He hung up and deleted all of his messages so we couldn't use them as proof and blocked me on Discord and Overwatch. Seems suspicious for someone who is seemingly innocent. Thankfully, my sister managed to get screenshots of what he was saying and I kept them in my phone for a while. Most of you probably don't realize how much this affects you psychologically, but it takes a huge toll on your mental health. I'm pretty sure I started self-harming again after this and I had to have two therapists. One for my regular appointments and one for my self-esteem and how I see myself. They were both great therapists, but I still sometimes blame myself, even though it's probably been over two years since it happened. I still think about it and I still sometimes wish he wasn't a creep and that he was just lonely and I know that it's not okay to miss him, but I do sometimes because I sometimes miss the love and attention he gave me even though I know it wasn't real. Be safe online and... Don't trust strangers on the internet. They can always lie about their identity. The backwoods of North Carolina are full of old sleeping houses that ought to be torn down. They dream only awful things. I grew up in a very, very small farm town with a population below 150 or so people. I won't name drop the town for obvious reasons and even if I did you wouldn't find anything to write home about. There's a caution light and several abandoned buildings, a barely functioning gas station that will grossly overcharge you and that's about it. You go more than half a mile in any direction and you will officially be outside of the city limits, though there are dozens of people who live in these heavily wooded farmlands that call the town home simply because it's the closest thing in shouting distance. Though, that would be akin to saying that Mars was within shouting distance of Earth. I've had a few experiences in these woods that I can't fully explain. I can describe them and I will, but I cannot afford any scientific explanation for them. I know that tales of wendigos and skinwalkers and other natural forest demon spooks are popular, but wendigos are a creature that belong to the tribal legends of tribes centered around the Great Lake regions of the northern United States, Wisconsin and Michigan and into the eastern coast of Canada. Skinwalkers are exclusively tied to the Navajo religion and Navajo grounds, which are in the deserts of the far west of the United States. Keep that in the back of your mind as you read this. I first began to notice the presence when I was around 12 years old. Playing in the woods was really the only pastime I had available to me outside of playing video games, but video games got old rather quickly. I was an only child and there weren't any other children in the area so exploring the woods was a good outlet for my imagination. Prior to my first real experience, the spookiest thing in the woods around here would have been a venomous snake. Even then, 
The snakes we have aren't likely to kill you unless you just seriously neglect the wound or have an allergic reaction. Aside from them, the largest predators we have are coyotes, which are mostly afraid of humans, and the rare cougar that happens to be passing through, which is so infrequent that it isn't even worth worrying over. So the first day in question was a normal summer day. I was out hiking, collecting rocks, building forts out of sticks, you know, the standard things a 12-year-old boy does. It was about sundown and I wasn't quite ready to head home yet when I noticed something was off. During the summer in North Carolina, the woods are anything but quiet. You have a cacophony of sounds, cicadas, crickets, frogs, birds. There's a whole chorus of wildlife that all wants to be heard. Heck, you may even get the occasional coyote pack howling or a bobcat screaming. The point of this is that the woods are far from quiet, and sudden silence in the woods in these times is not an accident. But that's precisely what I noticed. All of the sounds had stopped. I could hear the wind between the mixture of old growth and pines, and I could hear the distant babbling of a creep, but that was it. This was strange to me, but at the time I didn't realize what an ill omen it was in and of itself. I actually remember thinking that the water sounded peaceful and walking deeper into the woods to listen to it better. As I did though, I began to get this overwhelming sense of foreboding. It wasn't the standard, I feel like I'm being watched. No, I didn't feel eyes on me or feel like I was being followed or any of those standard paranoias. This was like, have you ever stayed at a party too late? You know, you got there at 9 and now it's 2am and suddenly you realize that you don't know anyone who is still there. You also didn't see this new guy come in, but he's glaring at you and come to think about it, so was that girl in the kitchen. You've overstayed your welcome and it's probably time to go. That's exactly what it felt like even if I lacked the metaphor to express it at the time. The air itself felt heavy. Everything in my mind and body was screaming at me that I needed to leave, that this place was not mine anymore. It had been fine in the morning hours, but now, this was the domain of someone or something else, and I wasn't welcome. I remember feeling as if the trees were warning me, leave or else. So I did. Initially I walked, but by the time the sun had begun its descent and the sky had begun to darken in the twilight, I was jogging. I never broke into a full-on sprint, I don't know why, but I felt showing too much fear was a bad idea. Eventually I made it back to the road and looked back to the woods. I didn't see anything, but that's when the feeling of being watched set in. I felt that there were eyes just beyond the tree line and out of sight, and that they were staring right back at mine. I went home and pushed the experience out of my mind as best as I could. From then on, I made it a point to always be out of the woods by dark or to have a firearm with me if I knew I was staying later. I should note that there were several times after that that I wound up in the woods at dusk but didn't have this feeling return. There weren't any special circumstances that seemed to summon it, just sometimes things were fine. Others? I all but sprinted for civilization. I didn't have any more overt experiences, however, until years later. I don't know what the catalyst was, but the activity ramped up dramatically in a year's span. The first experience like this was in October of 2018, and since then, the woods have gone from a home for the occasional unsettling experience to a place for actual danger and terror. I went camping with some college friends of mine during the October in question. In total, there were just three of us, and we were mostly roughing it. We had a tent, but we chopped our own firewood and all of that jazz. We camped pretty deep in the woods. It was dark by the time we were fully set up and had finished cooking. We ate and then we proceeded to get very drunk. I don't know how much we actually drank as we were just sipping out of a handle of vodka and passing it around the campfire as we talked about everything from ghost stories to the more tangible fears in our lives such as our dating lives and the prospect of post-graduation plans. This went on well into the night, with the stories growing more nonsensical and the laughter growing louder as the bottle grew lighter. By 1.30am or so, it had grown deathly cold. I decided that was a night for me and that I was going to get into my sleeping bag. The other two weren't ready to sleep yet and one of my friends, we'll call him Frank, decided he wanted to smoke a cigarette. Meanwhile, the other friend, we'll call him Tim, 
decided that this was a good time for him to go climb a large rock about 70 or so yards away from the tent. Frank begrudgingly goes to supervise him while he finishes off his cigarette. So they're both a good 70, maybe 80 yards away from the tent. I'm now in my sleeping bag and trying to fall asleep, and I can hear them laughing and talking and it's obviously far away. It's right at this time that something heavy slams into the side of the tent, like heavy enough that I'm surprised the tent didn't collapse. I didn't move. I was drunk, but not so drunk as to not realize that whatever was out there didn't stop to borrow a cup of sugar. That sense of dread filled me at once, and even though I had my shotgun with me, I couldn't bring myself to reach for it. I felt staying still was a safer approach. I heard something breathing. It wasn't human breathing, though. This was loud and weirdly wet sounding. It wasn't sniffing or anything like that, just deeply breathing. This only went on for a total of a fewer than 10 seconds, and all at once, it was gone. No footsteps, no banging on the tent, no gradual decline in breathing, nothing. It was gone, and Frank and Tim had never seen that it was there, let alone what it might have been. It honestly probably best that they didn't. They stayed up a while longer before turning in. I woke up first and stepped out to see if there were any footprints. There weren't, but there was something more ominous. The entire clearing we were camping in now had scattered throughout the grass and early morning frost circles of bone. Not large bones, no, but crushed up and arranged bones of small creatures like a rabbit or a small bird, maybe. I would assume we were in a predator's hunting ground, save for the fact that the bones were neatly arranged in circles, all of the same sizes and with equal spacing. I woke Tim and Frank up. We packed up and left immediately. This last experience is the most recent and the most intense. There was a meteor shower not too long ago, and I returned to the clearing where my friends and I had went camping to observe it as there is very little light pollution at it. It was stellar, and I loved every second of it, but I wasn't out there long when my dog, I brought him with me, he's good company, and he started acting strange. He had pinned his hair back while lying down and was now staring very intently at the tree line. He wasn't barking or growling. He was silent and just watching. It was strange, but I assumed that he'd caught wind of a deer or other prey animal and he was on the hunt, though he was far too lazy to actually go chase it. After a moment, a nearby coyote howled. I felt a wave of relief as my dog's behavior was beginning to make me uneasy. He was just tense because of the coyote and it would pass. There was something wrong, though. First, coyotes hunt in packs. It's extremely uncommon for a solo coyote to hunt and howl like this. Second, my dog had begun to whimper now and was shying back to the edge of the truck as though he were afraid, and the coyote was drawing closer, it seemed. My brain began connecting a lot of dots. The woods were silent. That feeling had returned. I was in the same spot as the last encounter, and then I registered the sound of branches breaking. Coyotes aren't heavy enough to do that, I thought. And the second I did, as though whatever was out there had waited for me to realize it, the coyote stopped pretending to be one. Or at least it... I don't know. It stopped howling. It then erupted in the most horrible sound I have ever heard. The coyote was laughing. It wasn't a hyena sort of laugh, though. It was this garbled, mangled mess of sound that sounded like an animal trying and doing a terrible job to impersonate the cadence of human laughter. And it was on this recording track where after every fourth laugh, it seemed to loop. It was rapidly growing louder over the sound of breaking branches. I frantically jumped up, grabbed my dog, and fumbled for my truck keys to get out of there. As I tried to get my keys and get my door open, the laugh stopped only for this guttural and deep scream to resound from the forest. I say deep to emphasize that it wasn't a bobcat or fox. They have a high-pitched sound. This was very low. It had the same pitch as, say, a roar, but it was in that same horribly botched nonsense that the laugh was in. Of course, the laughter resumed immediately, but as I got in my truck and turned the lights on, 
dead silence. In a moment of stupid bravado and curiosity, I turned my truck towards the tree line before I left to shine my headlights and see if I saw anything. Between the trees I saw what seemed to be a man. He was of average height and wearing a white t-shirt and I assume blue jeans, though I couldn't see a face or arms or anything of that nature, just his silhouette and his clothes. In hindsight, I think he was only a silhouette, maybe. I blinked, and he was gone. And that's my story. I don't know what is in the backwoods of North Carolina. I don't want to know, and it's probably best you don't try to find out. It doesn't seem too welcoming to strangers. I lived with my girlfriend of seven years for over three years now in a decent apartment complex in a small town in the Iron Range of northern Minnesota. I've talked about my more severe encounters while living here with some sort of entity in another story, but this is about the less impactful but still really weird and creepy things that happen. My girlfriend A and my two friends G and K have experienced here. There's a lot to say as far as noises go. By far the most common one to hear around the apartment that can be explained is the cats digging in their litter boxes, then scratching on the walls to scent afterwards. Annoying, sure, but welcome in the face of trying to sleep and hearing some weird stuff only to realize it's just their annoying habit. Something less welcome and one that not just me and A have experienced, but also our former roommate G and almost yearly guests for a week K have heard is the footsteps. It's very identifiable as sweaty or wet bare feet on the linoleum tiles that cover the kitchen and dining area floor just inside the front door of the apartment. The living room is straight ahead of that door and carpeted and is also where our guest bed and couch is. There's a hallway to the right as you come in that goes off of the dining area that leads to the bedrooms and bathroom which, aside from the bathroom, are also carpeted. So, no matter where you are in the apartment, you can hear those footsteps as they reach the tiled floor. It's the sound of the slap, then the resistance of the wet, sticky skin as it peels away from the floor, only to be followed by another slap. I make this sound when I'm not wearing socks, as I get sweaty feet even when not wearing my boots or socks easily. I'd know it anywhere. Kay described hearing these almost every night, Expecting to either see me or A come out of our bedroom into the kitchen for a drink of water or something, or at the least a cat being loud enough to be mistaken for a person's footsteps. But he never saw anything and, on a couple of occasions, heard the footsteps trail onto the carpet, making those soft puff noises heavy, bare footfalls make on cheap, puffy carpeting. He definitely is not as afraid of the paranormal as I am, but has also been shown to not be as sensitive to atmospheres as mere A, claiming he felt nothing in both our storage room and a room in G's parents' house that has become infamous in our circle of friends for having an incredibly negative and unwelcoming atmosphere. He just writes it off as being weird but creepy and making him slightly less comfortable sleeping in our admittedly open living room with an unseen visitor prowling about. A and I constantly also hear these footsteps and oftentimes they startle the cats if they're out and about in the kitchen or living room. Pan, our younger male tabby Manx, has a very wimpy, almost kitten-like meow and has a habit of doing that sort of chirp or sort of growl when he gets surprised or touched. And we'll hear it a lot when we hear footsteps in the kitchen while he's in there. It's generally closely followed by him complaining with a long high meow as he hates attention unless he's seeking it and him tearing down the hallway into the bedroom, onto the bed, and usually by extension, me and A. Inky, our chunky, solid tuxedo female of about seven or eight years, just either hisses or growls at it. If whatever it is comes near her, then the same result of her tearing down the hallway and using us as a landing pad on the bed. Major point being, it's as scary to them as it is to us, apparently, validating that it's not just us going nuts. Another much less welcome thing that we occasionally hear less often is vocalizations. I don't know whether to call them talking or what, but you can never make out what is being said. Now, we live in an apartment building, so you'd think hearing other voices isn't uncommon. 
Our neighbors are mostly comprised of older folk, and only three or four of the units that have tenants are anywhere near our age. We're both 22 currently. That being said, the most noise we hear from any of our neighbors is footsteps through the floor, the main front door, which is right outside our bedroom nonetheless, and rarely the older lady that we share a wall with watching loud TV. And even then, it's all muffled and obviously coming through the wall. When I talk about vocalizations, I don't just mean the usual muffled voices or grunts that a lot of people describe. I mean spatially reasonable, in the apartment, unexplainable noises that people would make. A couple times both me and A have heard a giggle or snippets of a younger girl saying something indistinguishable. It always sounds weird, like it's been passed through a weird filter on a voice changer, but not enough to sound inhuman, just off in some way. This is rare to hear. I personally hate hearing it since it always throws up a red flag in my head about demonic imitation to put people off guard. A thinks it's genuinely a little girl. More than once I've heard a raspier man clear his throat behind me. Not like a growl or clearing phlegm, but like he's doing the ahem spiel to get my attention. A has heard it too, but not near her only when I'm around, and always seems to come from near me. It makes me extremely uncomfortable, and I always get the feeling I've learned to trust in reference to supernatural occurrences, the heavy, almost electrified feeling in the air, feeling watched, the tickling in my gut starting, then turning into nausea or pain in my stomach. It's something I've felt around weird stuff since I've been able to recognize it as a child. My not-by-blood grandfather on my dad's side died of a heart attack over a year ago. He wasn't grandpa and his wife wasn't grandma. They were papa and nana. I have a pillow made out of one of the shirts he regularly wore to remember him by as he was really close to his grandkids, even if we weren't really his. He loved this like we were. It's on the top of a bookshelf on our living room. He never called me by my full name or nickname. That is just a shortened version of my full name, but... I was always Nicky to him and Nana. He had a super distinctive old coot type of wheezy voice, kind of high-pitched but not weak at all. He and Nana were the only ones to call me by that nickname and nobody ever said it that way they did, which is why it was unmistakable to me when I heard him call my name from the living room almost five months after he had passed. It wasn't the only time either. Many times I'll be home alone and I'll hear his voice call my name or laugh warmly at something from the living room. A has even on one occasion seen his short, stocky frame standing next to the bookshelf, smiling. It's really sad to think about, but oddly comforting to think that he sticks around to visit his family every once in a while. Less comforting is when you hear the deadbolt lock on your front door being played with. Me and A are the only ones with keys, aside from my grandma, who is the co-signer, and feeds the cats when we're gone for a day or more for us. No one else has a key aside from the landlord, and she barely comes by the apartment other than to pick up rent checks or show an empty apartment to a possible tenant. It would have to be someone or something physically playing with the heavy steel turn handle lock for our large steel cord front door. Whatever is doing that also likes the lever handles on all of our household doors. It's definitely common to hear them being jiggled, unlatched, or just turned a few times. The only time I've witnessed one actually move, the door was forcibly slammed, and in a room with no windows, and the way it shuts, it makes it pretty hard to do that. The whole air vacuum thing when closing a door in an almost sealed room aside from the air vent for mold avoidance pretty much cushions the door from being thrown shut by someone. Trust me, I've tried. It would have had to have been pushed shut by a force that followed through enough to make it rattle in its frame afterwards. I thought it was Pan climbing onto the top of the door, since he is a bit special and doesn't realize that doors move when you put force on them, but him and Inky were laying on the bed while I watched this happen. As for other things that visually happen, almost nothing I haven't already discussed in my other post. Occasionally you'll catch a glimpse of something tall and dark poking its head around a corner in the apartment wherever you are relative to the corner, and then duck away as soon as you notice it. Creepy, but not really scary, and I honestly find it more endearing to think about, like it's shy, or that it took my short speech of not being overbearing on its presence 
as if it wanted to stay with us after a certain incident. I was 12 years old, living with my dad one summer. I was in the middle of playing Black Ops Zombies with my cousins and we were on a hot streak. It was around midnight and my dad enters the room, bottle in hand, telling me to get some cigarettes from down the street. I didn't tell him no because he always expects me to do it without question. As he exits the room, I get my shoes on and head out the door. It was a pitch black night with only a few stars in the sky and a single street lamp at the end of my block, opposite my destination. We were living on a reservation at the time, so I knew the place inside and out and would occasionally go on a clear-your-head walk, but never at night. It was always a rule of mine to never go outside after dark, since it always felt like I was in an abandoned inner-city suburb like the kind you see in metropolitan areas. But luckily, the lady I get cigarettes from only lives a block away, so I had no reason to worry. But that didn't last long, because when out walking alone... I immediately got that feeling of being watched, almost to the point that you feel someone is right behind you. So I walked faster. I got there less than a minute at my speed and immediately knocked on her door. She was an older woman, probably in her 60s, so it took her a minute to open up. But it wasn't her who answered. He was a large man, about 6 feet tall, 40 years old, and had a beer gut. It was her son, and I've seen him before inside the living room watching TV while the cigarette lady, as we all like to call her, was the only one to open up to make exchanges. Only a dollar for two smokes. I had the dollar, so I asked him. He wasn't the nicest guy, though, because he was more than willing to wake up his mother right after shutting the door in my face. At this point, I just wanted to get back to my game and call it a night, but I digressed. About a minute passed before the door opened up again, and... It was her this time. The poor woman looked exhausted, but she was willing to give me a couple of cigarettes. But before handing them over, I looked up at her. She was staring at me like she was staring off into space with this blank expression. Normally, she'd be chewing my ear off, but she was unusually quiet. Her stare alone became very unsettling with her mouth opening up a little, just to let out tiny breaths of air. She didn't break eye contact with me. I was 12 years old and I didn't know what to do or say in this situation. What was wrong with her? Why is she acting this way? I couldn't think of a good answer, I just wanted to go home. So I reached in my pocket for a dollar bill to give her. When I was looking down at my pants, shuffling through my pockets, I noticed she dropped the two cigarettes. I looked back at her to find her with a frightened expression. Her eyes filled with so much dread as they widened. Her breathing turned huffing grew more frequent. The way she looked made me feel like she'd never seen anything so severely haunting in her life before. This, in my 12-year-old eyes, scared me because she wasn't looking at me. She was looking over my shoulder. This made me very uncertain of what to do at this point, so I thought that I'd make a run for it. This was too much, but the woman quickly grabs my arm and pulls me in close. Right then, I thought I was going to get abducted by this crazy old woman, but she looks me in the eyes and whispers, do not turn around. I was so scared and confused, I couldn't ask a single question. He will get you if you turn around. Come inside the house, where you'll be safe. I knew then and there, this was a red flag, so I pulled myself from her grasp. She yelps and tries to grab me again as I try to run but I stopped dead in my tracks right away because now I realized what the old woman was referring to. At the end of the lawn stood him, the tall man. When you hear stories about him, you know what he looks like. He's ten feet tall with long arms, wears a trench coat and top hat, and is said that he preys on lonely souls walking alone at night, and he's right here in front of me. He was nothing but a silhouette, a shadow, but... The old lady's porch light illuminated the whole front yard, accentuating his presence in full view. I could see him top to bottom, standing in my direction. I didn't know what to do. I was frozen. Just then, the old lady shuts her door, leaving me outside to defend myself. It was me and him, and there wasn't a fight I could win. 
He was just standing there and the thought of being abducted by him just filled me with utter dread. There was only one thing I could do. I ran. I ran back home as fast as I can with tears streaming across my face. Then I heard a burst of wicked laughter screeching from behind me. He was chasing me and getting closer every second as I heard it getting louder. Once I get back to my house, I thought I was safe, so I turn around to see, which I now think was the stupidest thing I'd ever done, where I caught a memory of a haunting image of him launching himself forward with his long arms, trying to snatch me with his huge hand wide open. I finally let myself in the house where I quickly lock the door. My dad finds me and sees that I'm in total devastation. He picks me up and hugs me. It took a while for me to calm down and explain everything. Once I did, he believed me and so did everyone else. That's where my dad made a promise to not make me go out that late again. It took me a while to get over that incident that involved moving away. I didn't come back for a couple of years, but when I did, it was only for visits. When I was in bed scrolling through my phone one night, I came across this article where a fire was lit on an Indian reservation, my own. The article consisted it was a house fire, and everyone inside was burned alive. One elderly woman, one middle-aged man. I knew the exact house they're talking about. So I started digging into the story, trying to find out how the fire was lit. There was no answers and only theories. I spent the whole night trying to piece it together, only making weak sauce. I was about to give up. Then I came across a photo. It's the house mid-fire, and right there, I could just hear the screams of that poor, old, friendly woman. I started to analyze the photo. It was a wide shot, probably snapped on a phone with a clean camera, and it's the middle of the night, nothing that stands out. Then I found something obscured in the darkness, but the fire illuminates it just enough for me to see. It's tall, dark, and wearing a top hat. I have a couple of stories to tell here, all of them involving my family's cabin in Wyoming. For starters, I need to put this into context. I was born and raised in South Dakota, and if you ever look at a map of it, you'll see that it's a great beige, almost rectangle, with a singular circle of green right on the west side of the state. That's where I grew up. Now, the west side of South Dakota has some pretty amazing sights, and it kind of makes up for there being next to nothing to do here. But in my opinion, nothing here holds a candle to the cabin. The cabin is exactly what it sounds like. A log cabin with no running water, a well, and a creek adjacent. The only modernity it has is electricity, and that was added in the 1930s. It's an hour away from my home, and if you die up there, there is no chance you'll ever be found so it's my favorite place to go. It was great when I was stressed from high school and just needed to get away, and now that I'm 25, it's my favorite place to unwind after a long week. But that being said, it has its quirks. I'm going to start with the most normal of the stories. Not normal because this happens all the time, but because there was no paranormal, extraterrestrial, ooga-booga stuff. I was 13 at my sister's birthday, my sister and I always celebrate our birthday up there. My dad had to leave to take my sister's friend who couldn't sleep over back at their homes. My mom doesn't like to spend the night up there, so she left before the sun went down. This left 13-year-old me with about 5, 10 to 11-year-old girls, and in short, I was miserable. I was poking at the fire, planning on dropping some scary stories on them so they would have nightmares when... I heard a distinct rustling noise coming from the dry creek just ahead of us. I looked up from the fire and saw a figure approaching us. I told my sister to quietly get back to the cabin. She looked at me and was about to definitely say why when she saw that my eyes were fixed in a singular point. She followed my gaze and not long after saw an old bearded man, wide-eyed, stumbling toward us. She screamed prompting her friends to scream and they all ran back to the cabin. The screaming stunned me as I was sure that this man would now proceed to kill me and after he was done, marched to the cabin to finish off the girls. But that didn't happen. Instead, he stopped and just started mumbling. 
I could only make out a few words. Deer, rope, crick, and razor blades. Eventually, I gathered up the courage to tell him off. I let him know that there were guns in the cabin, and if he didn't leave, I would go get one. After I said this, I began backing towards the cabin and eventually retreated inside. We told my dad when he got back what happened, and he wasted no time gathering up people from the surrounding community. The old guy was caught, but not by the police. He was caught by his daughter, who thanked my dad. I wasn't there for that. I guess this guy was just a very old man with dementia who wandered out of his cabin and followed the road to ours, thinking it was one of the cutoffs to the creek. As for the razor blades, well, back in the 70s, a group of rednecks got tired of city people swimming in their creek, so one of the rope swings they attached razor blades. A bunch of kids cut their hands up. The rednecks were never caught, and they all managed to do was get every rope swing along the creek cut down. Ultimately, I feel more sad than scared when I remember this. However, this is only the first story I have from up there. The next one happened when I was 19. My first long-term relationship had just ended, and to say I was taking it hard would be an understatement. Fortunately, my childhood friend, who I'll call Josh, was coming back to South Dakota from basic training. This was also around my birthday, so I had already gotten some days off of work. There ended up being a ton of people going up there, so many in fact that there was no room for me to sleep inside the cabin. That wasn't an issue for me though as at the time I drove a Subaru hatchback and I had no qualms about sleeping in my car. I had a whole system. I blew up an air mattress, put down my back seats, slid it in and I was off. The air mattress took up the entirety of my back seat and trunk leaving no room for me to put my clothes while I slept. So I grabbed some hangers from the cabin and when it was time to go to bed and hung up my clothes up on the inside handle of my trunk door, I kept the door open because I like the night air while I sleep, the weight and warmth of the blankets mixing with the general feeling of chill that came with the mountain night air was and still is very relaxing. I was even happier when it started to rain. However, that night I woke up with a strange feeling just kind of looming around me. I sat up and got a little disappointed at how deflated the air mattress had gotten before I started to hear the soft squishing noises of bare feet in mud and grass. I looked out the windows to see who was coming to scare me. I was naturally irritated and called out saying something to the effect of, F you, I hear you. But no one made the presence known. I bit the bullet and threw the covers off of me, hopping out of the car into the pouring rain. I looked around my car and didn't see anyone. I was confused and a little scared but decided it was a good idea to just go back to sleep. As I wrapped myself back up I began drifting off to the sound of raindrops tapping the roof of my car and then as I was about to sleep there was a loud thump that ripped me awake and sent me flying back up. It sounded as though someone had just slapped the back window of the car and thus I didn't sleep that night. When the sun started to come up, I donned my clothes, which were somehow still dry, and began to search the surroundings. Sure enough, there were footprints around my car, and a single handprint on the back window. I thought about letting the group know, but decided against it, as they probably wouldn't have believed me, even if I showed them the evidence, but also because I didn't want to ruin the weekend. The only one I tell is Josh, who also said it was a good idea not to tell anyone. He's a very spiritual person and believed then, as he does now, that it was some kind of ghost. I have a few others, but this is already way too long, so I'll just end it on the most recent happening up there. Due to financial irresponsibility that is 100% on me, I now live with my parents again at the age of 25. As such, I've been helping out where I can, doing the shopping, mowing the lawn, and taking the dogs out. But recently my dad and I started renovating the cabin at the beginning of the summer. We fixed the road, which had collapsed in the 80s and we had been driving around for years on end, and fixed up the well so that it actually pumps water now. We finished the well yesterday actually, some family friends came up after the renovation and we all had a good time. Beers were had and the cabin was full of laughter. Around 3 o'clock I packed up my stuff and left for home. After a few hours my mom got back from work and told me she was heading up to the cabin with dad and the family friends. I assumed that they'd be gone for a couple of hours at most, but by nine I figured that they were spending the night up there. 
Mom still doesn't like doing that, but we'll do so to make Dad happy. But at 11, I heard the heavy front door shut. When I came out of my room, I saw them both quietly walking in like something bad happened. I said that I thought they were spending the night, and my mom said no very quickly. My dad asked for help tomorrow. At the time of typing this, it's today, to help him fix up his car which quit out up there. Then he said, after that we'll go for a hike and find out what that god awful noise was. He said it sounded like a horse violently dying and my mom backed him up. Apparently everyone up there heard it and the festivities stopped soon after. I was doing some schoolwork at my computer a few nights ago and without realizing it, my mind had drifted off. Fresh to hours of constant schoolwork and grunge music at its max volume. Hardcore Tool, Marilyn Manson, Rob Zombie, Nine Inch Nails, the best of it. My mind blanked out a short moment and next I knew I was back on the late night grind. Not a coffee pun, but I wished I had that extra caffeine to have kept me awake to prevent the horror that ensued. I still kept typing away at the keys on my laptop, writing an essay or doing schoolwork that I'd been scared of being behind on. I was doing whatever. However, I get a text message from my grandma telling me she's coming over. She's been the only grandmother truly in my life, but not someone I would have expected to come alone in the middle of the night as she lived an hour and a half away and my grandfather was always with her. I decided to brush it off as she had business in the area and wanted to say hello to me and my mother. While here, I wanted to show her my essay, the one I recently had to write for my English class as it was still fresh on my mind. You can perhaps see how this is creepy because it took place in the most realistic setting with some eerie familiarity to it. When my grandma came over, I hit pause and it paused like I should have expected. Well, I started talking to her and handed her my school-issued iPad to read over. My music started playing again. Heavy, loud, ear-piercing unexpected. I've been talking to my grandma for a solid five minutes and suddenly, unprompted, Marilyn Manson's Kill For Me started blasting. I hit pause on the computer. It didn't stop, so I turned my volume down on my headphones, all the way. It didn't stop. Would you kill, kill, kill for me? It blasted. My mind felt numb, but in that first moment, I felt more embarrassed that my computer wouldn't shut up preaching such explicit music while my grandmother was right next to me. I had gathered nervousness as I unplugged the headphone from the jack. It didn't stop. Kill, kill, kill for me. Incredibly frightened, I threw off my headphones and the words kept playing on as I felt my mind melting. I mouthed something along the lines of wait to my grandma, unable to make a sound as the lyrics kept surging my head with loud, shocking violence, and I ran to my parents' room, knocked until the door opened from how hard I hit it. The room's door handle doesn't work, truth be told. My very real nightmare included all the details, not a single short stop. Without a doubt, feeling the door grind against my knuckles as I thrashed it was so heartbreaking as my head felt like it too was shattering. The door swung open as I rushed into the room. My mom was laying with my stepfather and even with my headphones off, my ears kept ringing and my brain was telling me to kill. The chorus started again and I mouthed my words to no avail. I didn't know how to speak and it took me a moment. Audio still extremely loud and consuming my mind, sinking into a thick mud. I told her that I couldn't think and I started to burst into tears, holding my head and screaming and babbling. The music won't stop. The music won't stop. I don't want to kill. And on cue, the chorus was saying, Kill, kill, kill for me. Realizing my future would be me, alone, sitting in a padded cell as I would never think a straight thought again, I felt a warmth around my ears and a chill on my feet. I shut my eyes while my face slowly shifted from a sharp sting to nothingness. I opened my eyes and saw a dark reddish orange-like glow of the light strewn around my room. I was horrified and confused but worried because I wasn't in my mom's room anymore. It hadn't struck me that I was in bed, but the music kept playing. I had still not rid myself of the headphones that were on and I hit them off. Finally I was awake and it was all over. I could think. I could hear and it took me a moment to fully comprehend what had happened after I paused, unplugged, and slammed my laptop. I wasn't going absolutely effing insane. 
I had a nightmare and I drifted off while listening to my edgy teen playlist at max volume. It was so vivid and I felt every moment of it. Days later I can recall every single second of it. It was a very similar experience to another that I felt when I was 9 or 10, but I was in Boy Scouts then and the dream was only me watching my father, a random no-name girlfriend of his and myself getting consumed by zombies. So never listen to music when sleeping or you may actually get trauma from it, or maybe not. From word of the internet, enveloping yourself in activity and music while slowly falling asleep is a good way to lucid dream. I've heard that sleep paralysis and lucid experiences while dreaming means it was an overall pleasant experience, so I guess I can just chalk it up to a lucid dream. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. And if you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash let's read official, and give and receive feedback from the community and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video and join my Discord to interact with me and other listeners directly. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon, and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt. And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all these stories in long compilation form and save huge on data, located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the bio. Thanks so much, friends. And remember to always do your pushy uppies.